Hi folks, hope everybody's okay, love to everybody out there, it's good to be with you. Uh, you can get me on my website, jasonburnspreacher.com and Amazon, etc. Hope everybody's okay. I just want to talk about Roman Catholicism and ask the question, is the Roman Catholic Church a true church or not? I hear quite a lot, I've heard quite a bit by evangelical uh, pastors saying that we should merge with the Catholic Church, that we should be united with the Catholic Church, that we're all one in Christ, and that we should be united. Now, my position is that the Roman Catholic Church has apostatized from true Christian doctrine. So we can't be united with the Roman Catholic Church until they abandon some of their fundamental doctrines, repent and come back to the Word of God. Now, does that mean there are Catholics that are saved? I'm sure there are some Catholics that have become born again. If they've become born again, the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, should teach them and lead them to see that in the Catholic Church they've, they've turned away from the Word of God. So any anybody who is truly born again today, who is truly a Christian, if you're being encouraged to unite with the Roman Catholic Church, all I would ask is, is the Roman Catholic Church biblical? Is it standing on the Bible? Or has it moved away from some fundamental things? Now, this is an article on Catholicism uh, by, by the writer Charlie H. Campbell. Charlie H. Campbell, and it's an article on Catholicism on ABR Apologetics Ministry. So you can get this article so I'm reading some of the information from his article. So on the issue of purgatory, the Catholic Church, he says, teaches that redeemed people who have trusted in Jesus Christ will not go directly to heaven when they die, but to purgatory, to suffer through a time of purging that will prepare them to enter heaven. The Catholic Church says that the time of suffering in purgatory cleanses an individual of imperfections, sins and faults. Catholics differ in their opinions on the nature of the suffering in purgatory. Most believe that suffering will include the physical pain of burning in fire. Regarding purgatory, the official teaching of the Catholic Church says, quote, If anyone says that after the reception of the grace of justification, the guilt is so remitted that the depth of eternal punishment so blotted out to every repentant sinner that no depth of temporal punishment remains to be discharged, either in this world or in purgatory, before the gates of heaven can be opened, let him be anathema, Council of Trent. Now, that that is a very serious theological statement. Because in Justification by Faith, in Romans chapter 3, where it says from verse 1 to 24, uh, we are justified by faith. In fact, um, I've got my Bible, my King James Bible here, so if we turn to that, um, let's just turn to Romans uh, chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Just bear with me a minute. Okay. So if we go to uh, Romans chapter 3, we read in verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto one, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified, here it is, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So, we're justified by faith in Christ. Now, what that means is, uh, imagine you've got a chair, and you sit on the chair, okay? The chair is is holding you up. That's your justification. Faith is that you went and sat on the chair, but it's the chair that saves you, yeah? Faith receives the salvation, but it sits 
on Christ and rest on Christ. And that is our justification. Okay? And what it's saying in the Council of Trent here is that we're not justified. We're not declared right before God. There's actually a purging going to go on. And uh, so that's a very dangerous teaching. Another one is praying to the dead of the saints. He says, first, let's consider praying for the dead. The Catholic Church teaches that Christians who are alive on earth can and should come to assistance to souls in purgatory by intercessory prayers that can ease their suffering and speed up their release and send them on the way to heaven. Evangelicals reject all this on the basis that there is no scriptural support whatsoever for these kinds of prayers, nor is there even a single example anywhere in the Bible of anyone praying this anyway, and for good reason. So you can read uh, Norman L. Giesler and Ralph E. McKenzie, Roman Catholic and Evangelical Agreements and Disagreements, page 34. Second, let's consider praying to Mary and the saints, says the Catholics. The Catechism says, uh, the witness who have preached unto the king, un, uh, sorry, the witness, it says, who have preached <coughs> us into the kingdom, especially those the church recognizes as saints, sharing the living tradition of prayer by the example of their lives, they contemplate God, praise him, and constantly care uh, in brackets, not true, for those whom they have left on earth. Their intercession is their most exalted service to God's plan. We can and should ask them, the saints, to intercede for us and for the whole world. This is right off the Vatican website. And so the Catholic Church encourages followers to pray to saints. Humans have preceded us unto the heaven. So the danger is there is to miss the high priestly that, that Christ is our high priest, sat at the right hand of the Father, and he intercedes for us. So this danger of saint worship, or saint praying to saints, takes away the glory of Christ and his intercession uh, for us. So, I'm just trying to... On the issue of Mary, the Catholic Church teaches that Mary was immaculately conceived, that is to say, preserved from the strain, stain of original sin. Pius Pope IX, 1854, lived in a sinless life, remained a virgin from the birth of Christ, was carried bodily into heaven at the end of her life, plays a part in our salvation as co-redeemer with Christ. In Luke chapter 147, it says, My spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. And it says, Romans 3.23, All have sinned, and there is no one righteous, Psalm 143.2. So Mary was not sinless. She, she had sinned, because it says, All have sinned. And our Saviour is not Mary, but Christ. So the danger of saying that Mary... Uh, had an immaculate conception where it, she was sinless is very, very dangerous because it's deifying Mary. It really is. It's taking Mary and honouring Mary and taking it too far. And again, it takes away from the glory of Christ. I don't want to say this to hurt Catholics, but I'll just it just has to be pointed out. Excuse me. Evangelicals believe... The Bible is made up of 66 divinely inspired documents that God determined would would make up the canon of scripture. In 1546, at an event known as the Council of Trent, the Catholic Church added 11 Jewish writings to the Bible, known as the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is a collection of 14 Jewish writings that were written down between 200 BC and AD 100. Uh, 11 of those 14 books were accepted by the Catholic Church as a God's inspired scripture and were placed in the Catholic Bible. So that's the Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, Tabit, Tobit, Judith, 1 Maccabees, 2 Maccabees, Baruch, uh, additions to Esther, Prayer of Azaria, Susanna, Bel and the Dragon, etc. 
The Catholic Church says, If anyone, however, should not accept the said books as sacred and canonical, canonical part of the Bible, entire and all their parts, and if both knowingly and deliberately he should condemn the foresaid tradition, let him be anathema. Um, so they say, you know, let him be an anathema if you don't agree with the Apocrypha. Some reasons why we don't have the Apocrypha. Neither Jesus nor the New Testament writers ever quoted the Apocrypha as scripture. Though Jesus and the Apostles cite the Old Testament nearly 300 times in the pages of the New Testament, they never quote any of the Apocryphal books except by the Roman Catholic Church. In Jude 1, nine and 14.15 there are some allusions to some extra-biblical writings such as the Book of Enoch and the Bodily Assumption Moses, but this doesn't lend any support to the Catholic position because they, even they reject those books as non-canonical. And none of these are called the scripture or as divinely authoritative. The New Testament simply refers to the truth contained in those books, which otherwise may and, may and do, do have many errors. These writings are rejected by Roman Catholics as well as Protestants. Remember that even the Apostle quotes pagan poets in Acts 17.28. So what he's saying there, in the book of Jude, there is a quotation of uh, books outside the Bible, but he's saying that Jude doesn't regard them as divine, just like Paul quotes secular poets in Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. So that doesn't lend support to the Roman Catholic view of Apocrypha books. The Apocrypha number two contains numerous historical, geographical and chronological errors. The example in the book of Judah that speaks of Nebuchadnezzar in Nineveh, but it is a historical fact that this was never the case. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. The Apocrypha claims that Tobit was alive when the Assyrians conquered Israel in 722 BC, and also when Jeroboam revolted against Judah in 931 BC, which would make him at least 209 years old. Yet according to this account, he died when he was 158 years old. The Jews themselves never accepted the Apocrypha as inspired. The Jewish people and the leading Jewish teachers of the era recognized that the collection of Jewish writings did not belong to the Hebrew Bible. The first century Jewish historian Flavius Josephus tells us in his writings that the Hebrew Bible was composed of the same books that make up our Old Testament today. An Alexandrian Jewish teacher, Philo, an Alexandrian Jewish teacher who lived at 20 BC to AD 40, quoted the Old Testament numerous times from virtually every Old Testament book he never quoted from the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha contains no predictive prophecy to help substantiate claims. Apocrypha never claims to be the inspired word of God. The Apocrypha was rejected by many of the leading church fathers. Uh, Jerome rejected the Apocrypha and left them out of his Latin translation of the Bible, the Vulgate. Jerome, who lived in 340 to 420 AD, was the man who translated the first for the first time the Bible from Greek into Latin. Jerome is considered to be, to be the greatest biblical scholar and Hebrew scholar of the early, early medieval period. And Jerome's to, uh, translation, known as the Vulgate, became the Bible translation for centuries to follow. It even became the official translation of the Roman Catholic Church. But he did not want the Apocrypha in there. So that's just some reasons why I don't think the Catholic Church is a biblical church. It's got serious issues. It's added scripture that is not biblical scripture, that is not inspired. It's deified Mary. It takes away the glory of Christ concerning his intercession for others. And it adds to salvation by purgatory. So these are fundamental issues that no Christians should follow. And, uh, you know, they also advocate the authority of the Pope and tradition above the Bible. And these are very, very dangerous things. So, you know, the Catholic Church is not a true church.